I have a surprise announcement. We are now official members of an elite top secret organization. Really? MI6? OSS? Zowie? Better. Spy Hards has officially infiltrated the world of Patreon, and we're inviting listeners everywhere to join us. Delicious. Question. What classified perks will patrons be able to set their sights on by subscribing? Well, that depends on which tier you choose. We have a wide variety to suit every budget from $2 to $10 and lots and lots of perks for our patrons. This sounds definitely like the Aston Martin DB5 of Patreon clubs. And subscribers can look forward this month to exclusive Agents in the Field episodes on The Rock and The Sting, starring Paul Newman and Robert Redford. That's right. So, Agents... Join the circus, as they say, and we'll see you over at patreon.com slash spyhards, that's S-P-Y-H-A-R-D-S, and Cam, roll the episode. Hello and welcome to Spy Hard's podcast where your hosts go deep undercover into the world of spy movies to decipher which films make the knock list. But remember, this information is strictly for your ears only. I'm Agent Scott. And I'm Cam the Provocateur. And Scott, I love you. I should hope so. Mm. Hmm. That was my outro line, so I guess we're done already. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, well, I, we already may have spoiled it, but, you know, this film does feature some death, some Bond death, which is very on trend at the moment um, for, for many reasons. And so we thought we'd bring someone in with, you know, such lethal cunning. And it is, a, maybe I've, I've already spoiled it there, but it is, of course, the host of the Empire Film Podcast and writer for Empire Magazine, Chris Hewitt. Chris, welcome to the show. Hello, guys. This is a very sexful podcast, and I'm glad to be here. <laughs> you flew in first class on little Nelly, and here you are. <laughs> I, did, I did, yeah. Clinging to the undercarriage. Just <laughs> how I like to start my weekends. Sorry, I've gone full double entendre already, and I'm... I'm <laughs> it's, it's, it's good. This is how we do it. what happens when you get me talking about Bond. I just, I've, I've just did a two and a half hour sport special for No Time to Die, where I, I went to some very dark places. Uh, and I, I don't quite know what happens when I talk about Bond. Something comes over me. It's very, very strange. But anyway. <laughs> I think we're about to find out some more. Um, but I, I suppose I want to like introduce the genesis of how I thought about having you on the show. I was actually listening to one of your episodes about Spectre. <laughs> Everyone else said no. Uh, yeah, uh, last last guess. Helen was busy. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, literally everyone else said no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was your Spectre special episode, I think, from years back. And mm. you mentioned this week's film as one of your favorite Bonds. Yes. And it doesn't have a good place in my memory. So I was like, well, I think he's the man. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, I will say that so the Spectre one was recorded in 2015. Would have been 2015. Uh, and the last time I had seen You Only Live Twice before revisiting it for this podcast was in 2006, whenever uh, myself and two of my colleagues from Empire, uh, Nick Dissemlian and Sam Toy, embarked upon a Bondathon, which I would highly unrecommend to anybody. <laughs> Uh, and it's exactly what it was. It's exactly what it sounds like, which is that we decided to watch. This was just before Casino Royale was coming out. So at that point, there were just 20 Bond films. So we decided to watch all 20 Bond films in a row. And a whole experience took 42 hours and uh, and really put me off Bond for a long, long time after that. And uh, uh, it was it was quite horrible. We had a five minute break in between films. But then every three films, we would take a 20 minute break. And so it meant that the Connery films were great because you were, you know, you had lots of energy and you were raring to go. And then the Moore films dip in quality, but also you dip in energy. I have no memory of the Brosnan years whatsoever. <laughs> uh, it was just, just a, a horror show. Uh, but I came out of that with I've, during lifelong love of Bond, and that really tested it. But uh, you only live twice 
was one of the better films. I've, I've always liked You Only Live Twice. And that was one of the better films in the Bondathon experience, perhaps because it was only <laughs> the fifth one up. Uh, but it is always, it's always lodged in my memory. Yes, it is potentially problematic in certain areas. It is contentious in others, of course, but it has so many great landmark Bond moments and so much great Bond iconography in this film as well that it is a very, very big one for me in a number of ways. Do you remember just tracing back to the origins of being into James Bond? Where did it come from? I think it's it's just part of growing up in Britain. I, I don't even know whether I liked James Bond. I don't think I was given a choice in liking James Bond or not liking James Bond. It was just something that, that happened. Here is a James Bond film. It's on TV. You're going to watch it. You're going to enjoy the James Bond. Look, there's a man in sharp suits going around the world, killing people. Who wouldn't want to do that? Uh, so it was something that, you know, honestly, growing up in Britain is something that happens Maybe not so much now because of the way the TV works and there's so many different channels. But when I was growing up, because I'm very, very old, uh, there were only a few channels on the telly. And Bond being on ITV on Bank Holiday Mondays was a huge, huge thing. Sometimes it would be on Sundays as well. But I have such memories, such sharp memories of watching mainly the Roger Moore films and then the Sean Connery films as well growing up. Uh, and they'd be on ITVs on, on Bank Holiday Mondays. And so I don't remember, I don't have a, a recollection of watching You Only Live Twice for the first time, but I do remember things like watching Live and Let Die for the first time and, and you know, going through that, that very early discussion about which Bond you prefer. Is it Moore or is it Connery? Because poor old George Lazenby never really got a look in. <laughs> uh, and this was before the days when there was another Bond to talk about, which was, of course... Timbo Daltz. Um But yeah, Bond is it's just always been there. It's been part of the fabric. It's, it's part of the fabric of, of British culture. It's just it's just there. Did you ever fall out with the franchise at all? I know some people who were long-term Bond fans struggled through, say, the Brosnan era, for example, or the Dalton era. Were you always connected to it? I, I think I was very lucky in that I couldn't discern quality in a Bond film for a long, long time because I was too young to. So the dreadful Moore later run so moore's first three are fantastic you know live and let die the man with the golden gun spy who loved me are top quality bond films absolutely up there in, in any bond top 10. after that there's a real big drop off uh I'm, moonraker's fine for your eyes only is ambitious and tries something different but it's ultimately quite dull and octopussy and a few to kill are terrible but I wasn't able to really tell that. So for me, they were just all Bond films. So it's not like I saw those and the scales fell from my eyes and I had a, some sort of you know, Damascene conversion or, or, or whatever. So I never really had that experience. Um, so I've never, I never really got to the point with a Bond where I was really, really hugely disappointed. Um, the first Bond, I, I saw License to Kill in the cinema as a, as a teenager, but... Uh, the first Bond I remember really religiously going to the cinema to see was was Brosnan, Brosnan's run. And, you know, again, that's a bit of a spotty run. It's a patchy run. It has the all-time worst Bond film in there, which is Die Another Day. But no, I never fell out of love with the franchise until I spent 42 hours in a lobby at my work, <laughs> eating nothing but KFC, drinking nothing but Coke Zero, and um, spending, you know, if we can, we're all friends here, spending pretty much the last four or five hours of that on the toilet. Um, that'll test you. That'll <laughs> test you. If you can come out of that with your love of Bond and Tired, then you're doing well. You didn't uh, work Never Say Never Again or the uh, original Casino Royale into Christ that marathon, no. did you? <laughs> Evangelical. Evangelical. It's it's <laughs> Eon only. I'm not going to stick Casino Royale in there. It just gets far too confusing. And Never Say Never Again. If you think if you think Connery's wig is bad and you only live twice, then... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on. My God. Never say never again. Never say never again to whoever came up with that hairpiece uh, for that. Please, please. It's awful. Uh, so, no, don't put the unofficial ones in there. And uh, if you're asking me, if anyone asks me now if I would do another Bondathon, no, because there now there'll be five more movies and No Time to Die is longer. I think, then at least three of the Moors put together. So you don't want to do that. 42 hours, it would now be closer to 60. No, that would just destroy you. It's not something I think I could ever embark upon. I was just thinking of um, a comparison. It's like watching the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit films. And that, the Die Another Day is like the last Hobbit film. It's just 
an awful way to finish what could have been a nice start. Hey. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you, you don't defend that film, Cam. <laughs> So you've never done a Scott, you've never done a Cam, you've never done a you've never done a marathon, you've never been tempted to sit down and strap yourself to a chair for twenty hours at least and not sleep and just go for it. I've done twenty four hour film festival things um, at independent uh, theater houses around here, but um, no, I've never sat down in, at home and watched like a twenty four hour run of anything. I've done you know maybe three movies in a row, but that's about it at home. Oh, amateur! I know, right? It's embarrassing. Three films in a row, my god. <laughs> Well, this is why you're here, Chris. You clearly have better credentials than we do. <laughs> that's it, yeah. I think I've gone insane. That's, that's my credentials. Well, that's all you need for this film. Speaking of, Cam, we've already said it, but what are we doing? We're doing 1967's You Only Live Twice. There you have it. Keeping up. <laughs> I, I thought that was uh, Millennium for a very long time, the Robbie Williams song. I didn't <laughs> see this film. I, I thought they stole it, but... Uh, <laughs> Ah, um, how young I was. I know. Well, here's the uh, the letterbox.com synopsis for those keeping track. You only live twice. You only live twice. And twice is the only way to live. <laughs> A mysterious spacecraft captures Russian and American space capsules and brings the two superpowers to the brink of war. James Bond investigates the case in Japan and comes face to face with his arch enemy, Blofeld. Dun, 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 dun. Kill James Bond. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk about that guy's voice later, but we'll, we'll, we'll get there. Mm-hmm. Um, Chris, you said you didn't remember when you sort of first watched this. Mm-hmm. I I think I first watched it as part of a marathon when I was rewatching them all, but not not in a row. Sorry, Chris. That's right. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's fine. You can watch Bond in, in any way you want. <laughs> I'm okay with that. I should watch it and not enjoy it. That's how I should do it. Damn it! Yeah. Uh, Cam, do you have a story? Um, I remember this was one of the last of the sort of classic era Bond films before the Brosnan stuff that I ever saw. They put them all out on VHS, and I remember buying this one and going and watching it at my great aunt's house. And I was very familiar with Dr. No, Thunderball, Goldfinger, the kind of the other classic Conneries. And I remember watching this one as, you know, the final of the classics. It was kind of like discovering an episode of a TV show that you didn't know existed. Like there was a real bonus to it. And I remember enjoying it, but also not connecting with it the way I did say Goldfinger. I think that's probably fair. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Well, Oh, Oh, contention already. No, 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 no. no. All good. (laughs) Um, well, okay. Cam, can you swallow us up in your space capsule of knowledge? How did you only live twice happen? Right. So this was based on the, um, uh, later Ian Fleming novel, the finale of the Blofeld trilogy from 1964. They chose to um, kick off their Blofeld cinematic version with the finale from the books. The book uh, was based on a diplomatic mission in Japan where Bond encounters a uh, villain named Dr. Shatterhand, who he reveals to be Blofeld. And um, yes, so they decided to adapt this and they recruited director Louis Gilbert. Uh, he had done a lot of films. He'd started in the mid 40s. The only film of his I think I've seen is uh, 1960's Sink the Bismarck, which is a pretty notable war film I did enjoy. Uh, But in 1966, he had made Alfie with Michael Caine, which was a big breakthrough, Best Picture nominee. And so he was very appealing. And he was recruited by Cubby Broccoli and said, no, thanks, not that interested. And so it was finally Cubby had to win him over by saying, look, you get to play with all the biggest toys. You'll have all the budgets. You can do whatever you want. It's going to be a phenomenon. So that kind of got him on board. And so they turned to writer Sidney Boehm, who had written movies like The Big Heat and Rogue Cop, to do an outline. He had produced an outline that was similar to the book and that it was Blofeld and Irma Bunt in a castle. There was a female Japanese spy named Chiono. And ultimately, there was a 139-page unfinished draft that came out of this that went really nowhere. His name is not on the finished product, so there you have it. They brought in Harold Jack Bloom, who had done mostly TV, but he was an Oscar nominee for 1953's The Naked Spur, which he'd written, a Jimmy Stewart Western. And he submitted a new outline that was quite similar to the finished film, minus a um, fear gas subplot that would have tied the whole thing together as opposed to a space race. And the castle was still in the picture, and it was going to be set on the coastline. But they went to go scout the coast for castles, for locations, and there are no castles on the coasts in Japan. 
So that became an issue. And along the way, <laughs> they saw volcanoes. And the world was never the same. <laughs> Austin Powers had material for years. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, Cubby Broccoli was like, let's build a, a um, volcano. And he turned to um, art director Ken Adam and said, can you make a volcano? And he's like, I, I don't know. And he said, you've got one million. Do it. Well, we'll talk about the results of that. But uh, ultimately, like, that's what this movie's most famous for, probably. Um, another notable note for this one was um, Lewis Gilbert, Ken Adam, cinematographer Freddie Young, and the producers were set to depart Japan uh, and ended up staying last minute to view a ninja demonstration. The plane they would have uh, been on ended up disintegrating over Mount um, Fuji, killing everyone on board. So, wow, <laughs> that is pretty terrifying. Shows you the simple twist of fate there. It's a, it's a strange alternate universe. Mm. You only live twice, indeed. Mm. Uh, and so, um, yeah, Harold Jack Bloom redid his drafts and took his notes and introduced the space program, but the producers weren't happy yet, so they shelved it. And they recruited Roald Dahl, who was the British novelist, close friend of Ian Fleming. I think we've all probably grew up reading Roald Dahl um, books as youngsters. Is that true? Um, not hugely, actually. No, it's not. It's not really in the schools too much here. I wasn't really handed a Roald Dahl book, I don't think. Yeah. Oh, really? That's interesting. Yeah, like for me, it was a real standard. I read a lot of his books as a kid. Really, I read the um, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and Charlie and the Great Glass Elevator, but everything else, James and the Giant Peach and the BFG and the Giant Peach and the Witches and the Giant Peach, all the Giant Peach novels, I, I missed. I missed <laughs> all of those. Uh, anything to do with chocolate, I was on board. Anything with peaches, no. <laughs> See, like Fantastic Mr. Fox, I recall being one of the, the first novels, yeah, <laughs> and the Giant Peach yeah. that I read as a kid. Like that was a big uh, novel for me. But ultimately, they brought him in. He hadn't written a lot in terms of film or TV, but he had done a couple teleplays. He did like Alfred Hitchcock Presents, for example. And um, he basically came in and was like, "The book's terrible, so I'm just going to look at Doctor No and try to copy that because that was pretty good." <laughs> Which is funny because this film is copied like two more times down the road. Mm hmm. Yep. And so, you know, his draft ended up going forward and they started casting and they cast Akiko Wa uh, Wakabayashi for Kissy and Mia uh, Hama for Aki. And there was issues along the road in that um, um, Hama was struggling really badly with English, whereas uh, Wakabayashi was actually really picking it up. So it turned into a problem where they're going to have to lay off Mia Ahama just because of the English issue. And so they um, ended up talking to her and she was so, I guess, ashamed of her progress that she threatened suicide. And so they said, OK, this is a problem. So they ended up switching the roles so that the one with less dialogue would go to her. So that's why she is ultimately kissing Suzuki in the film. Um, pretty crazy story, actually. And they talk about it on the uh, documentaries on the DVD, and they don't do it with any sort of joking. Like, they are actually quite serious that they were very concerned. Yeah. The production itself was hell for Sean Connery. He was hounded by paparazzi. This was largely what led to him leaving the role. The producers felt so bad for him over the course of this shoot. They ended up cutting his uh, other film he was contractually obligated to do and let him out of what would have been Honor Majesty's just because this poor guy suffered throughout the entire shoot. So he seemed completely done with it. There was scandals along the way based on misinterpreted things he'd said and just awful, awful shoot for Sean Connery. Um, the only other thing really to note was um, some other castings that came along uh, along the way. Eva Renzi was who they really wanted for Helga Brandt. And we covered um, Eva Renzi when she was in Funeral in Berlin as Samantha Steele. Um, turned it down so Karen Dorr got it. Also, they cast as Blofeld a Czech actor named Jan Werick. And he looked a lot like Santa Claus. Um, and he had very poor English and was quite slow moving. So they were kind of struggling with him, but they decided to keep shooting. But about two weeks in, he fell ill and they brought Donald Pleasance in. So there's a lot of twists of fate with this movie. Whether you like it or not, the final product was very much based on a lot of uh, luck and circumstance. Ho, 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 seven. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. I'm, I'm, I'm deeply sorry. That's good. I'm deeply sorry. I like it. I like it. So this one had a budget of $9.5 Domestically, it did $43.1 International, 68.5 For a worldwide total of 
So it was a big hit, but it was $40 million less than Thunderball. So make of that what you will. It was number seven. <laughs> yeah, I know. It was number seven at the year at the domestic box office because it's tough to find top hundreds for international in this era. So it was number seven domestically between Two Sir with Love and a film called Thoroughly Modern Millie, which I think we can say we're all huge fans of. <laughs> Thoroughly. <laughs> Who doesn't love it? Thoroughly. Thoroughly fans. <laughs> yeah. Top three for the year. Number one was The Graduate. Number two was Disney's The Jungle Book. Number three was Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. And a couple other notables. Number 13 was Casino Royale, the 1967 spoof. And number 20 was In Like Flint, the James Coburn spy film that we've covered on this podcast. So just a final note. Um, Roald Dahl had a really good relationship with Eon. And so they ended up bringing him over to write Chitty Chitty Bang Bang the following year. And that is a hallucination of a movie. And uh, Connery was done. This was the end of the Connery era as far as anyone knew in 1967. But we'll talk about that more in the future. Yep, never say never again. Mm. It's, a, it's the first of his three I'm done with this S films. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> well, I guess we should probably get down to it. Um, Chris, you're the guest. Mm-hmm. You are the one who inspired me to invite you on to talk about this. So I want to know, what's your opinion on You Only Live Twice now? Well, <laughs> it's a tricky one, isn't it? You Only Live Twice. Because there is so much in here that I think is really bold and ambitious and to be celebrated. And as I said earlier on, there is a lot of really great Bond iconography. You were talking there about all the happenstance that happened, um, that occurred during the, the, the filming of the movie and the little ripples into pop culture. And say, for example, had that Czech actor Jan Werek, I believe is how you pronounce his name. Yeah. Had he not fallen ill, had he not been replaced by Donald Pleasance, who then decided to play Blofeld in that way with that voice, although the cat was already part of it. Would Dr. Evil have turned out the same way, you know, yeah. 30 years later or, or whatever it was? So there's all these little ripples, all these little wrinkles that, uh, that you know, it's, it's in, in its own way, it's a hugely influential movie. I think it might low-key be, in a weird way, one of Connery's best, if not his best, uh, role as Bond, it, or, or certainly film as Bond. You know, I like a lot about, obviously, Goldfinger and From Russia With Love. Uh, it's interesting that this movie did not do as well at the box office as Thunderball, given that stuff actually happens in this film, which is not... <laughs> <laughs> the case with Thunderball, which is the dullest Bond movie uh, by some <laughs> considerable margin, uh, and stuff actually happens in this film, and there's great things in this movie. You know, the, you know, the the arrival of Little Nelly, the idea that Q can actually get outside his his uh, his workshop for once and go on the road. There's the opening with Bond, you know, but that obviously comes back into play in License to Kill, which is, as we all know, the greatest of all the Bond films. And then there's you know the the opening with Bond being quote unquote killed there's the idea of there's a great sequence on a rooftop which you know because lewis gilbert i know was worrying about how you present action and you know, do you just basically replicate everything and leave it to the second unit or replicate everything they did in for much of a love and and goldfinger but there are great fight sequences in this there's a fight between bond and a and a big fella when they when he first goes to the osato laboratory and they have a you know, sword fight which turns into a bit of a brutal brawl so there's echoes of the Robert Shaw train fight in that. There is a great sequence on a rooftop where Bond is being chased by a whole gang, uh, you know, huge, huge number of uh, gangs, a uh, huge number of, uh, of of thugs. And Gilbert does this really interesting thing where he just pulls the camera back as far as he can do in a helicopter shot, and you get to see Bond running along the rooftop trying to get his, you know, trying to get away from this this uh, this gang of miscreants. So there's really interesting things in there. Like Blofeld's iconic. The the big set at the end, the Ken Adams set is iconic. And you know, for, for my money, it's the most influential Bond lair. It's the most influential Bond bad guy lair. It, it knocks strips off the uh, the lair of Safin in No Time to Die. Hmm. Um, but you know, also there are problematic elements as well. This is a movie that was almost completely shot in Japan. It is almost completely set in Japan. Uh, it is a movie that I think has the best of intentions and has his heart in the right place in terms of trying to respect and honor Japanese culture and cast Japanese actors in major supporting roles, which is almost unheard of uh, at the time. 
But at the same time, you have Bond, who is this you know, unchanging, entitled imperialist, as Paul Greengrass said on the Empire Pod, well, not in the Empire Podcast, but as Paul Greengrass said to me for Empire Magazine years ago, he's a right-wing imperialist fuckface who hmm. goes into Japan and, you know, there are moments that where Bond comes up against Japanese culture and butts his head against it. And there are moments that, that certainly now through today's lens can be seen quite frankly as problematic at at best and, and <laughs> frankly racist at worst. The first time that we meet Bond, he is in Hong Kong and he is kissing a Chinese uh, woman. And the first line out of Sean Connery's mouth in this movie is why do Chinese girls taste different than other girls? And you're going, Oh really? Yo oh, Bond, come on. You can't say that. Uh, and then, of course, there is a moment in the movie towards, I don't know, it's about an hour in or so, where uh, they decide, for reasons that I'm still not entirely sure why this happens, but they decide that for Bond to properly uh, infiltrate the bad guys, that he must become <sighs> a Japanese, and that is an actual quote. And so Bond undergoes light cosmetic surgery in order to make him look like a Japanese man. And... Which essentially means for Sean Connery, just brushing his hair forward, as far as I can tell. And that, in the 1960s, would have been totally fine, totally acceptable. Uh, but now you 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 shriek, you do the the uh, you do this emoji, the uh, emoji uh, <laughs> in real life, and you hope that that sequence and that part of the story passes pretty pretty damn quickly. Um, but I still think there's a lot to be admired about this movie and uh, a lot that is uh, a pinnacle in many ways for the Bond franchise. It's kind of hard to follow that up. So, Cam? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. Um, <laughs> this is one that I've always struggled with and that every time I watch it, it completely sucks me in off the bat. And I think if Roald Dahl is just ripping off Dr. No, I'm a big fan of Dr. No. And so I really get brought into the mystery here. I like that Connery, you know, his bond is going into Japan. He doesn't quite know what he's looking for. And we're following strings of contacts, you know, meeting Henderson and just some of these quirky characters. There's like a sumo wrestler mm -hmm. he has to meet with. Bits like that I really love. And just the entire search for what the lair is, I think really does hold up. And, you know, as uh, Chris said, like there's fantastic stuff along the way in terms of fight scenes and just some directorial choices that feel kind of weird for a Bond film, but actually really work. Yeah. Where the movie often loses me is the death of um, Aki, where I think this character is so dynamic. And the fact that we have this weird switch here is almost like I don't trace all of my problems with the movie to the death of this character. But it seems to be for me where the, the switch is flipped, where I just find a lot of the stuff at the end, as impressive as the big lair is, mm. I kind of feel the energy leave the movie like to me the mystery was much more interesting and i just wonder how much of that is to do with the fact that blofeld incredibly iconic and i love donald pleasance i wish he'd done more bond films but he's only on screen for 10 minutes he doesn't feel like a <laughs> villain that's sort of looming over the whole movie in the same way dr noted i was i read an interview with Ro roald dole about how he wrote this and he had to certain check boxes he had to do and one was bond had to shag three women mm -hmm. and so i guess that's why he goes from the lady in, in Hong Kong to the Aki, then Kissy. But I think it's sticking to that formula that holds this film back. Because as Chris said, there's these great things like that shot of the rooftop fight. That's not by the Bond playbook. That's something different, and it works. Little Nelly is a bit different, and it works. But that, I think when it sticks to the repeat formula, this is film number five now. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's where it starts to falter? Yeah. Yeah, but... But I like the fact that they were able to think outside the box a little bit, even five films in, uh, that they were able to take stylistic risks with this and to take risks as well with the narrative. I mean, I, I, I can't imagine that too many audiences watching this in 1967 would have seen that opening and thought, oh, my God, they've killed James Bond. But you never know. You never know. You know, it's a very different era. And there might have been some people who actually went, you know, did the full Alan Partridge. Oh, my God, James Bond's going to die. And, <laughs> you know, like, oh, they, they've killed him. They've killed him. Well, that movie's short. Well, we might as well leave. But, you know, just even that 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 opening with Bond being machine gunned to death and leading into the the opening credits of, you know, Nancy Sinatra singing You Only Live Twice uh, <laughs> or or Robbie Williams' Millennium, uh, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you will. <laughs> 
That was quite a bold choice. The stylistic, the way that that little Nelly is presented to us, which is a series of static cuts as we see little Nelly being assembled, is kind of different and outside the playbook. So Gilbert's trying different things. You know, I don't think he ever quite got, you know, he directed a number of Bond movies after that, including The Spy Who Loved Me. And I don't think he ever quite quite got that experimental uh, again. Uh, he was a, a little bit more formulaic. I mean, some cracking films later on, but uh, a little bit more formulaic. So I quite like the fact that they were able to take risks and, and go for broke a little bit. And I think I think they knew going into it, it was going to be Connery's last movie because his contract was up. Um and I wonder if it was, you know, during the during the filming that he decided that he wasn't gonna renew his contract or, or re up. But I think they knew going in it was gonna that was gonna be it. And it's interesting because if you obviously you compare the idea that this was Connery's fifth and final film as James Bond, and you compare that obviously to the one we've just seen. I don't I don't want to get into spoilers, but uh mm-hmm. um there are there are the comparisons and contrasts to be drawn between this and No Time to Die and how Connery approached his last movie as Bond and how Daniel Craig approached his last movie as Bond. There's also a lot of shades of Dr. No over No Time to Die as well. Yes. So, yeah. It's interesting the um, when you're looking at the history of, of You Only Live Twice, he, he announced he wasn't going to do Bond again during the production. But I he was already in bad terms with Saltzman and, and Broccoli. Like Apparently he wouldn't act when they were on set. That's uh, not a good situation to be in. I imagine they're, they're the producers, after all. Um, but it, it makes me think about, you know, a Star Trek callback. I'm sorry, but, you know, the Wrath of Khan. Spock, you know, learned the more wouldn't come back unless they kill him. Mm-hmm. And so you've got that thing. And then they throw in that act that, because it was common knowledge that he died in the film, Wrath of Khan, I should say. So they put the fake kill at the start. Yeah. And so you get that with this film as well. I just thought that was a, a strange little uh, comparison there. Imagine if they had killed him at the beginning of this, and then you're just watching. I don't know. You could follow Tiger. Tiger. Yeah, follow Tiger, or maybe follow Henderson, because that guy, that you know, Charles Gray, in that in that in that brief little cameo he does, um, is really interesting. I'd like to, I'd follow that guy, but I'm a Liverpool fan, so I'd follow anyone called Henderson. <laughs> I would watch any Tiger Tanaka film. Uh, what? Oh, yeah. I mean, he's an amazing ally. So yeah. He's so great. It's like, how have we got multiple Felix Leiters, but never multiple Tiger Tanakas? What's going on there? Yeah. Well, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to chip in with my thoughts, and I'm maybe going to poo-poo on the party just a wee bit. Um, Uh-oh. First time I watched this film, I, it was probably about 2018 in its entirety. I, I must have seen bits and bobs, Little Nelly, clips and that as a kid, etc. bits on bank holidays. And I saw the scene Chris alluded to where he becomes Japanese, and I, in my, uh, in my sensibilities, I, 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 I was like, oh no, and and so I put it down a peg. Mm-hmm. It had mm-hmm. such a great trajectory, you know, Doctor No from Russia with Love, Goldfinger. I'm not a great Thunderball fan, but oh. I can see why some people yeah. like it. I, I don't. <laughs> I like, like it. Thunderball. I'm a fan of Thunderball. <laughs> oh, which bit? How? <laughs> the whole movie. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I talked about it on the episode, but to me, that is like um, kind of island time Bond. Like, if you love the world of Bond, you get to just hang out there for two hours, 15 minutes, and just kind of soak in the ambience. Oh, that's because nothing happens. <laughs> but that's the beauty. <laughs> You're talking to a guy with a picture of a shark on his wall behind him right now. You know, he, he likes the sharks. This is why he likes Thunderball. So oh, we forgive him. I mean, the underwater scenes are interminable. What's going on? They're horrible. Oh. They are horrible. I'm sorry. Have you, se- have you seen them on the big screen? Uh, have I seen Thunderball on the big screen? No, I was busy that night. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe. Do you think that would, that would transform my Thunderball experience if, if it was slightly bigger? I'm not going to say it's going to change your entire vision of what Thunderball is, but I remember going to a double feature of Thunderball and Honor Majesties okay. um, here in Vancouver. And the underwater footage feels much more immersive on the big screen than it does at home, where you've got your phone, you've got the dog, you've got kids around. You know what I mean? Where mm-hmm. your focus is much more easily shifted. Okay. When you are watching it on the big screen, it feels like you're kind of more sucked into that sort of vibe. Okay. Don't you mean? All right. I... Don't you mean subversive? <laughs> I'll I'll keep him peeled. Sure. I'll keep him peeled for uh for any <laughs> Thunderball big screen experiences, and uh, I will see whether I can pop along to that. Because you know, honestly, that I've tried. I've tried with Thunderball. I really have over the years, but I, yeah. I just can't get on board with it at all. Whereas you, you only live twice, has his issues, has his problems, as we say. I mean, you're right. I mean, Christ Almighty, Scott, that that sequence. 
Uh, because it's presented so matter-of-factly as well, the tiger just bounces along to him and goes, well, of course, you're going to have to become a Japanese. And I go, what? Why? What? What? <laughs> Why would... How would that possibly help? What is going on? Um, he's already dead, he's technically. Dead. Like, he's been, Who knows he's alive? Who cares? He's been bouncing around Japan, punching everyone he meets. Like, uh, I don't understand how possibly going even more undercover is going to help. And it's going to set race relations between Japan and England back by decades. I don't understand <laughs> what's going on here. So, yeah. Well... And also, do we see it in any way effective? Because no. they're at the ninja training school, and he gets attacked by a guy with a spear. So clearly, that guy was able to uh, see through the illusion. Yeah, I mean, so I've never understood because in the book, the whole point was like Bond has a near death experience, you know, later on, and has amnesia and thinks he's a Japanese fisherman. So that's where the "you only live twice" comes from. It's like he has two different life, uh, you know, lives there in the story. Um, here, though, they obviously want to work with that and instead brought in this whole thing of cosmetics. I like that they show very extensive cosmetics being applied, and then it just cuts to him with like his hair brushed forward it. afterwards. But <laughs> I just don't understand what the how, like what is the what is the goal of this? Because it's not like we see him going undercover in any areas where anyone would even be looking at him. As a, he doesn't he doesn't go into the center of of Tokyo, and he doesn't pass. He doesn't go into a Japanese restaurant and pass himself off as a Japanese person. It just all feels very ill-considered, uh, very, very ill-thought-through and and pretty badly executed. But, uh, you know, because immediately you're absolutely right. Like one, of the few, one of the things that happens to him after he starts going through this this transformation is like, someone tries to kill him. And again, with the really one of the scenes that's most effective in the movie with the, the, the poison on the on the, on the the line mm -hmm. that, uh, that comes down and... Uh, Sadly, Mrs. Bond. Well, not Mrs. Bond, but you know, no, that's only that's only imagining the secret well, surface. <laughs> what's worse is it actually all washes off in the ocean. Yeah. It's not even good prosthetics. It doesn't hold. <laughs> yeah, it's awful. It's awful. Very bad. For me, I think this is a film of two halves. I think it's really great at the start. And as soon as Blofeld turns up with that strange voice, it just starts to take a nosedive. Little Nelly has taken a few shots and is starting to go down, unfortunately. <laughs> um, it's, but it's, as you say, it's really good at the start, the, how he gets killed, the fight with the guy who's actually The Rock's grandfather in the Osato uh, mm -hmm. lounge. That's a nice little thing there. Um, that's all really cool. Going to Japan, seeing Japan's, it's fun. Seeing uh, M and Moneypenny in the naval office. Yeah, it's nice to see them out on tour. Yeah. One of the few times they get to do that. Man with the Golden Gun is still my favourite with the sideways office. <laughs> but uh, um, that's all great. And then as soon as Blofeld turns up, I feel like the energy just disappears from the film, and it, it just slowly starts to stop being fun. And that's really what you come to these films for. There is a little element of that in most of these Bond movies. That by the time you get to the lair, it becomes a little bit rote. But no, I, I I like it. I like watching Bond stalk around in a series of bad disguises uh and then of course you have ninja assault at the end and who doesn't love a ninja assault an all-out massive war between blofeld and blofeld troops and specter's troops and tiger tanaka and his his ninja army and that's just that sentence alone should be enough to catapult you only live twice to the top of any any respected discerning bond fans list it's, it's really weird because i watched this and then i watched an episode of squid game afterwards <laughs> <laughs> and I, I had to, I had to, be, I had to point out the the color of the uniforms is just strangely similar. See the <laughs> influence of you only live twice. It still continues to ripple out even all these years later. You only live twice is basically an early Squid Game. I wonder if part of the problem for me was I would have loved to have seen this movie in 1967 because the problem was for me growing up. I watched the Roger Moore's first, so I'd watch Lewis Gilbert's Moonraker as well as Spy Who Loved Me, which are basically just remakes of this movie where you can really see he's perfecting his action chops so that I had absorbed over and over again the big uh, um, you know, enemy ship invasion in Spy Who Loved Me, which is really incredible. And so when I went backwards and watched this one, uh, look, I love the ninjas coming down the ropes into the volcano. What an amazing image. Like there's some fantastic stuff here, but I just find the action is just not as dynamic in this film versus even some of the other Connery ones where I was more sucked into it. Here I was like, I love the idea, but I almost feel like the scale 
maybe intimidated uh, Lewis Gilbert to some degree. Hmm. What are you talking about? Blofeld on the electric tram is is an action <laughs> highlight for me. Oh, that's very memorable. It's as, <laughs> yeah, the, it's as uh, good as it gets. Yeah. And let's not forget that this movie opens with a giant spaceship eating essentially another spaceship. And that's <laughs> this is a year before Kubrick would do 2001, A Space Odyssey. Mm -hmm. And the effects in that opening are better not only than the effects in 2001 A Space Odyssey, but better than any <laughs> film that's been made uh, since. Uh, so it surpasses Star Wars, surpasses Moonraker, surpasses Infinity War, anything to do with space. And this movie is the, the benchmark. Uh, also, uh, slightly uh, more serious than, <laughs> than that, is the, the John Barry score is an absolute belter. But, the, you know, you don't need me to tell you that it's John Barry, but it, the, the <laughs> capsule in space... That capsule in space cue is tremendous. I find myself haunted by just the image of that little man <laughs> on the uh, cable. A poor bugger. As the doors, yeah, as the doors are closing, and it's like no. Every time I watch this movie, I'm like, I, this part for some reason bothers me, and I don't know why. <laughs> it's like that moment in Deep Impact, isn't it? When uh, <laughs> I always go to Deep Impact. Uh, when Deep Impact, when John Favreau is on a spacewalk and gets cut loose. And one of the last shots we see of John Favreau is from inside his spacesuit, and you could just hear his panicked breathing going uh, 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 as he floats off into space to his certain doom. And you go, "Oh, come on! You can't do that to Favs." And that, this this poor guy, this could have been Favs' grandfather for all we know. He could run the family. <laughs> I always think of uh, De Palma's Mission to Mars as well, where I believe it was Tim Robbins is like slowly drifting away, and they can't get him back. Oh. Apparently, I really have a thing about being lost in space. This is why I'm not joining Shatner and hopping on a you know, rocket to space. <laughs> We'd have to send a Clooney and Bullock to get him back. <laughs> him, but not me. Yeah. <laughs> they'll, they'll leave me. <laughs> Precisely. Precisely. I think we'll spin into sort of some of our favorite bits of the film, favorite moments, things that we liked about it. Um, I mean, I will just say that space is way more fun than water. Oh, <laughs> them's fighting words, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, not sorry. I'd rather watch, you know, starships docking with each other, strangely. Very phallic scenes, but I guess that's why Austin Powers went there. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, then, uh, yeah, then 20 minutes of scuba diving. Well, fair. I mean, I like that we're seeing that 60s sci-fi. This is one year after Star Trek is on the air as well. So, and this uh, the ship here does remind me a little of the Doomsday Machine from the episode of the same name from the original series. Uh, so, I, I enjoy that stuff. And as, as great as 2001 is and all of the sci-fi that's come since, it's really pushed the technical boundaries as to what we can achieve. I do really love watching these sort of kitschier depictions of space. Like, I just find it a lot of fun. And it's the reason I go back and watch, you know, a lot of the old classic sci-fi films from the 50s is that some people will point and laugh at them. But to me, there's a real vibe they give off that's a lot of fun. Yeah. Absolutely. And but although I would quibble with the idea of this being kitschy, this is as authentic and mm, spot on as it gets. True. This is the space experience in a nutshell. It's also belittling the tragedy of all of the astronauts we lost due to cables <laughs> being cut short by uh, you know, little claws. <laughs> yeah, due, yeah, due to being eaten by a bigger spaceship. Yeah, yeah. It happened it happened all the time. Yeah. Very insensitive of me. I, I apologize yeah. to all the listeners. <laughs> Yeah, this is why Apollo 13 was a lie. When they said, Houston, we have a problem, they didn't mean that something had gone wrong inside the spaceship. It meant that they were actually being eaten by a bigger spaceship, but they can't They can't tell you the truth. And so I'm here to tell you the truth. Mm. 5G. It's, isn't it crazy that... Uh... <laughs> they were eaten by 5G. It, it, yeah, it's a, it's a precursor to now. They were just building up their strengths. Uh, it's like Pac-Man space. Um, is it... Isn't it weird that like In Like Flint came out two months after this and that also features a protracted space sequence? Yeah, yeah. Although this one's much more interesting. In Like Flint, <laughs> In Like Flint, you are waiting to go to space. You are like, I cannot wait to go to space. And then you get there and you're like, oh, okay, let's roll those credits. So, yeah. <laughs> Prescient. Mm. Well, I really wanted to see Derek Flint have sex in space, but we never got there, unfortunately. <laughs> He's attempted so, uh... re-entry. Oh, wow. I'm looking forward to getting to that one. Mm. But um, what, what about you, Chris? Something you liked? I think I've mentioned quite a lot of the stuff that I, I really, really liked in this. Uh, I, again, I think there's some really lovely visuals in this. I, 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 I like Blofeld. I mm -hmm. like Blofeld. 
I think this is the the gold standard. I mean, Telly Cephalus played him in in Honor Majesty's Secret Service, obviously. I I'm going to go slightly against the grain as regards to critical consensus in that movie. I know that's beloved, and I know that you know Steven Soderbergh loves it and thinks it you know pushes the envelope stylistically for Bond. But again, I'm a little bit like it's Thunderball 2.0 in that it's extraordinarily dull. Um, Ooh. It's got some. It's got some good stuff going for it. If it had a, a better actor than Lazenby in the lead role, they might have been able to pull off the the emotion of the ending. Um, but but Cephalus, Cephalus just doesn't work as Blofeld for me. Uh, it's really interesting that Charles Gray <laughs> plays him in Diamonds Are Forever. <laughs> I, I I agree with you. I would have liked to have seen Donald Pleasance play the role uh, across all the movies, even the bit in For Your Eyes Only where. I don't think they could show his face because I'm not sure they had the rights at that point, and so they basically just dump him down a <laughs> dump him down a giant uh, tower, and uh, and that's it until until Spectre. Uh, but Blofeld's introduction in this, where he leans forward because he's been teased for how many movies now? Four movies, and so you finally get to see him, and you know with the scar and with the cat and with that voice, and that's that's a great moment for me. And I mean, he's only on screen or has he only features in the movie really for about 10 minutes where it's actually, mm-hmm. you know, Donald Pleasance's face. And I know that Pleasance was quite involved with the visual design. He was very interested in what they could do. The original actor they cast, it was just a guy in a beard. Like they didn't have the whole facial prosthetic, whereas yeah. Pleasance really wanted to do that. And he regretted it almost immediately because the prosthetic was so uncomfortable and kept poking his eye. That I, I wonder if maybe that was a factor in him not coming back or if it was just that, I don't know. I mean, it's the 60s, right? Like they aren't super hung up on continuity if they just want to replace him. And I also don't know that I would have bought like six foot four Lazenby fighting like Donald Pleasance on a bobsled run. I think it might have been a little tilted in one direction. Savalas is a little beefier. But mm-hmm. to me, the just the impact of what um, Pleasance manages to achieve in this movie is so effective sets a template for a lot of the real big tier Bond villains that are going to follow. And in 10 minutes just becomes one of the most iconic images in the history of the franchise. So, I mean, he's absolutely astonishing in this movie. Yeah, he's great. Love a bit of all the blessings. Cam, anything else from you? Um, Yeah, I think the character of Aki is someone who really deserves a mention. And that this is a really dynamic character who brings a lot to this movie. Like, I enjoy seeing just how she is you know, interested in Bond, but she's also a really capable agent. And I think this is where, like, my problem with the movie is, is that I'm so on board with the Aki Bond dynamic. Like, I think they have genuine chemistry that when you kill her off, and I think her death scene is pretty amazing. Yep. If you're an actor and you have a death scene, you hope for something like this, that people are always going to remember that poison coming down the thread. But the movie loses something when she leaves. And... To me, that's kind of the issue is like you compare Kissy to Aki and Aki is just so much more of an interesting character. And I really am bothered by the fact that her death is like treated with really no regard whatsoever. Like Tiger's on to the next scene joking about, you know, the woman they're going to marry Bond off to. And it's like Aki deserved better because I think this character is a real high mark for the franchise at this point. Yeah, that's fair. That is very, very fair. And, uh, you know, but they had the Bond formula back then, as you alluded to, the Roald Dahl thing, mm-hmm. where apparently he said that uh, they had to have three Bond women in the film and two two had to die or two should die. That was the formula that was, that was handed down to him, mm. um, <laughs> which is which is which is wild. And obviously the, the Craig Bonds have bucked against that trend. Uh, and yeah, maybe Aki could have could have stuck around, could have stuck around to the end. I think, too, you know, you look at Joe Masterson in Goldfinger, who pops up very briefly and dies. But when you see her sister later wanting revenge, there's a sense that her life mattered, that it had ripples, just, you know, this very minor character dying, whereas like Aki, there's no ripples whatsoever. I think maybe that also uh, grates on it for me. Yeah, yeah. Bond's very much business as usual. Let's just get on with it. Oh, well. Mm -hmm. Poor old Aki. (laughs) <laughs> Aki also gives us like the only moment of joy that Sean Connery seems to have in this film when he sees her during the massage. Oh, that's cool. Well, I I, I have notes about his, uh, his performance, but like he sees Aki and he's Aki and like very there's a smile on the guy's face and I I haven't seen a Bond so happy since Daniel Craig wrapped on Spectre. You know that's. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, no. I've, I've said, I, I had that joke written down for a while. I'm sorry. I had to, I had to work it in somehow. Home run, Scott. Home run. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Uh, the only other thing I wanted to call out that I had for likes, uh, I pointed this out as like the star performance in Thunderball was the dog at the Junkanoo that was, was pissing, of course. And this film has another creature that is the star yes. performer, and that is the cat, of course, that is trying desperately to get away <laughs> from everything <laughs> happening around him. Especially in the, the end, when all sorts of squib is going off and explosions. If you're a cat, you're that's, you're not chill about that at all, are you? You just want to get out of there. There's a guy next to you, and he's got prosthetics in his face, and he's talking in a weird voice. You, you don't want that. You can almost guarantee they were regretting the choice of giving Blofeld a cat when it came to this movie. And they're like, look, Donald, can you just carry this cat in every scene? Because cats are not known to be the greatest actors. <laughs> yeah. Can we give you a marmoset or something like that? What's, what's more docile than a cat? <laughs> I think Robert Davy had it right with the lizard. Yeah. The lizard. Absolutely. They could have drugged the cat, I guess. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, there are all sorts of animal rights organizations uh, would frown upon that sort of thing nowadays. But it was the 60s. It was a different time. So I'm just saying, you know, they could have just injected the cat with heroin before the take and, um, and then just... <laughs> Hey, they were it. riding horses off of cliffs in 80s, so for never never again, we yeah. could do that in the 60s. Let's do it. Yeah, go for it. Go for it. You know, have a have a succession of stunt cats. You know, if the cat ODs, then then so be it. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, I, got dark. I would like to. Okay, I would like to point out that the uh, that uh, Spy Hearts does not condone uh, injecting heroin into cats, uh, whether it's on a movie set or or not. <laughs> And in fact, we strongly we strongly condemn that. You can tune in for Empire Film Podcast if you want to hear more of that. Yeah. <laughs> oh no! If you want to, if you want to, if you love cats, OD and heroin, go to the Empire Film Podcast. I, I don't even know why I called it that. I called the Empire Podcast. Um, but go to the Empire Podcast, and uh, we will meet your cat, OD and heroin needs, big time. <laughs> and it's funny because we just covered Gotcha recently, where they dart a tiger on screen as well. So uh, that seems to be an ongoing trend oh, on this yeah. show. Yeah. Mm. I don't care. The, the bigger the cat, the the. <laughs> The bigger the cat, the bigger the injection. Yeah. That's what I. That's what I. That's my motto. It's what I will do. I want to touch on just briefly the locations in this movie because you know obviously the volcano layer is unbelievable, mm-hmm. like just a masterstroke. But even just there's a real sense of the travelogue in Japan here that Bond movies used to do a lot was it was all about the location. How do we get the most for our dollar by visiting these locations? And it's something that is a little bit lost. You know, you look at No Time to Die, which has some great locations, but you don't get that sort of, you don't get to kind of soak in it the way you do in You Only Live Twice, which I think really does bring the entire kind of Japanese vibe just to the screen. Yeah, I think I think a great part of that is because in the early days, by and large, they were happy for Bond to stay in one place. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so, you know, he goes to Japan very early in this movie and they stay in Japan for the entire, the entire film. And yeah, there are problems, as I said earlier on, with, with, some of the ways Bond reacts to Japanese culture and some of the way that Japanese culture is depicted. The uh, in Japan, men come first, women come second line is another infamous line from this movie. Uh, but I would also say that it's fairly respectful in a way of Japan. It portrays the country in a lovely way. And yeah, you, you, there's maybe a little bit of a, you know, of a, of a box taking exercise in terms of some of the things you might expect to see in Japan. You know, they go to Ryokans, they go to a sumo wrestling match, but they're also, you know, it shows the country. I love Japan. I've been a number of times and it's, it's such a beautiful country, such a wonderful place to be. And this movie does kind of capture it without, without sneering at it or, or making fun of it, or or poking fun at it, uh, you know, for the most part, and uh, you know, and 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 it's important, I think, you know, to do that. This is a this was a huge franchise. It obviously, is a huge franchise still, but this was a you know, it, it's hard to I think really get across how big Bond was in the sixties, and so for Bond to do this to go to uh, Japan in the in the mid sixties and. And cast Japanese actors in major, major roles, as I said earlier on. It was such a, a big thing and such a commendable thing. And they also didn't dub Aki, which leading up to this, they dubbed the majority of the Bond girls. And just the fact she wasn't, I thought, was um, pretty impressive as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, Mie Hama was dubbed. Yeah, yeah. Ultimately. But yeah, but that, 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 is, that is commendable as well. 
not not dubbing her, but dubbing not not dubbing uh, Aki. Mm-hmm. I'm going to pivot us over to a couple of dislikes, maybe before we start looking at wrapping things up. And I want to bring up the uh, the Helga Brandt of it all, <laughs> aka Fiona Volpe 2.0. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, what were they thinking with this? I do not know why they wanted to copy her. I do not know. Also, what was up with that whole plane thing? But mm, you know, I have a sure. lot of questions. The plain thing I can forgive. I mean, there's a lot of rickety Bond villain attempts on Bond's life, so that's fine. But yeah, like, I don't have a real problem with the character of Helga Brandt. It's just the fact that following Fiona Volpe, who has more screen time and just more agency in what she is able to achieve throughout her, you know, hour or whatever in Thunderball, this character Mm -hmm. just feels much slighter, doesn't have the impact. And I will say this, though, she dies well. The piranha death scene, which the actress actually did do herself, um, you know, falling into that pond there, I thought was really effective. So I'm always down for a piranha death. But yeah, she's definitely no Fiona Volpe. <laughs> so she actually was killed by piranhas. She was she went full method and allowed herself to be eaten alive by piranhas. That is also accurate. Yeah. Yeah. Breaking. We're breaking the story. Yeah, we're breaking the story. Karen Dorr was killed on the set of Fiona <laughs> Twice. I, I respect that. I really respect that any actor who can really commit to their art in that way, fantastic. You wouldn't have, you wouldn't see that happening these days. <laughs> I couldn't see Daniel Craig doing it. I'm just saying. Yeah. No, he would. He wouldn't be nibbled by a fish. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, the image just hit my head there. Um, <laughs> um, Chris, I think you've mentioned a few things, but anything else? Uh, any quibbles about the film? I mean, how would you quibble with a movie this perfect? <laughs> Apart from all, apart from all the deeply problematic bits, um, uh, any any quibble? I don't. I, the theme song's not one of my favorites. Um, That's interesting <laughs> because people really do come down really strongly for that song. I'm actually in the same boat as you. I'm not a huge fan of the song, but people love it. She was the last choice. They went through several people before Nancy was was on. Yeah, they wanted Frank Sinatra. Yeah, mm. yeah. I think, uh, yeah, well, it might have worked a little bit better with him. But, uh, yeah, it's just, it feels like it's become, I think, a little bit more iconic because the score is really, really good and the score is incorporated into the song. And genuinely, I think Robbie Williams' Millennium has helped popularize that song or that that theme a little bit. But the song itself, I just find a little bit wishy-washy. Uh, it doesn't really stick in the mind. It doesn't grab you the way that you know, because you're coming off, you're coming off the the back of Goldfinger, which set the template for the Bond song, uh, to the point where Bond songs are almost more famous than the Bond films. And Thunderball, I have problems with that film. I do not have problems with that song, because my God, Tom Jones nails it. And then you just have this, it's just a little bit drab and a little bit humdrum and it doesn't really go anywhere. But thankfully it's short, that's good. Uh, that's good. And uh, in terms of other quibbles, apart from, like I say, some of the depictions of Japan and some of the depictions of Japanese culture, I think this is as solid a Bond film as you're likely to get. You know, it's um, it's interesting in that it's slightly different from Goldfinger, which is basically a game of cat and mouse between... Bond and, and the bad guy all the way through and here it's a bit more of a mystery a bit more as you say a bit, bit more of a Doctor No where he's not quite sure what's happening or who's behind it until the very very end but the scenes ultimately between uh, Bond and Blofeld solid solid stuff um, I think one of you I can't remember who who was said you may have maybe you maybe have problems with Connery's performance in this movie yeah that was Scott. is there a sense Okay, so Scott, did you have a problem, Do or do you have a feeling that because it was Connery's last movie and he wasn't especially pleased to be there and he was being besieged by paparazzi and whatnot uh, on set, that did you get a sense that maybe he's phoning it in a little bit? Is that is that one of your problems with that? It was actually the other side of it. I, I always hear about this film that Connery looks bored and doesn't seem to want to be there and because of all the problems you just mentioned chris but for me i feel like he's more just a a guy doing his job i don't i don't smile when i go to work (laughs) (laughs) i try not to who does i I actively try and frown (laughs) i want to let everyone know how miserable i am and how miserable they should be um damn straight yeah i i I think he's just a man doing his his job I, i don't see any problem with his performance i think he's just channeling a guy who's done five films and he's a you know well versed in the spy world 
He's not he's not beaming with a smile every time he walks into a room, but he never did. Yeah. Yeah, like I get the same sort of vibe here as I did in Thunderball from Connery, where he's really comfortable with the role. You don't have kind of that raw, kind of out of the box excitement you get in Doctor No and From Russia with Love, but he feels just very comfortable. I feel like we're kind of though on the precipice of tipping over into Diamonds Are Forever Connery, where he's just like strolling around the desert like a dad who's had a few too many in Vegas. Like, he, <laughs> you know, like here he's not there. Yeah. Like we're just seeing him kind of edging up to that. But I think he's still committed to actually trying to pull this off in a convincing way. Yeah. And like physically, he's great. Like you look at that fight, you know, with the Rock's grandfather there where he's like, hitting him with a couch and moments like that. He seems genuinely invested in the action and making it look convincing, which is not the case with Diamonds Are Forever. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I think he's very, very solid in this. Very solid indeed. And, you know, Bond goes, you know, the early days, I mean, the early days of Bond, Moore and Connery and certainly Lazenby, these weren't films that were concerned with whether Bond had an arc or whether he was a different person at the end of the film, whether he learned any lessons or whether he became a changed man or discovered a soul. They were just adventures that on which you happened to accompany Bond as he went around the world um, kissing people and killing others. And uh, perhaps there's a little element of that ennui creeping into uh into connery's performance here but i don't really see it i just i just see it as this just happens to be the latest james bond adventure and he's absolutely 100 percent solid in it i think i'm curious chris how do you feel in regards to the character would you like to see going forward more of these films driven by a bond who doesn't need an arc or have you really enjoyed the adding of the arcs to you know the craig era in particular no i'm 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 very much uh, old school when it comes to, to Bond. Uh, and it's interesting. I can see why, as an actor, you would want to push against that. You would want to push against the idea that this is an essentially unchangeable character uh, or you know, or someone who will just stand firm and can't be buffeted by the winds of change in any way, shape or form. I, I, and I admire that Craig went into it and wanted to do a, a, a five film arc and you know, the, you know the bond at the end of No Time to Die is very different from the bond we meet at the beginning of Casino Royale and that, that's fine and who knows maybe Timothy Dalton might have done the same thing had he stuck around in the role and had circumstances conspired to allow him even a, a third bond movie and maybe we could have begun to you know discern a, an arc there as well but I like standalone adventures and I like the, you know, you get enough of the serialized storytelling in the Marvel Cinematic Universe or, you know, the DCEU or even the Fast and Furious movies. You, you get all that. And I just, I love the idea that each Bond film is connected, obviously, you know, the, you know and the, the offensive one Bond movie can ripple into the next. So, you know, I've obviously... Bond gets married and not a match the Secret Service and that loss at the end of that movie does have a ripple effect on the Moore Bond and on the Dalton Bond and even the Brosnan Bond indicates that there was something in his past. So it's it's you know, it's all connected in that way. But I also like the idea that there are standalone adventures and I think sometimes the desire in the Craig movies to make each movie personal, to make each mission personal and to have Bond being affected and changed in some way got in the way of what were fairly simple and entertaining spy stories. And I want more of that. I want more Bond being a spy again. Yeah, like I like the idea that they were going for with World is Not Enough, where you had a Bond who was injured. They didn't really play it to what they could have, but just the idea of having like these mini arcs in a movie where Bond is going through some sort of personal journey, but we can tie it off by movie's end and then come up with something else the next movie versus the it's all connected theory. Yeah, and again, that's not to denigrate in any way, shape or form necessarily what Daniel Craig did. But mm -hmm. uh, but I I just grew up in the idea that these Bond movies were episodic. And maybe that the, maybe the fault lies with me. And maybe the fault lies with those movies. Maybe they should have tried to be a little bit more ambitious. Uh, and maybe if they had given Connery a bit more to do, he wouldn't have been so eager to pack it in after five movies. And um, I, I, even the Moore films, even like For Your Eyes Only, does you know, does try and push against tradition a little bit, and does try and push against the formula a little bit. Um, so you, you maybe even got a sense that Moore was getting a bit bored with it. The, of course, the, the antidote to that theory is the, is what happens next with the feet of a kill and, and, uh, octopusy 
uh, which are as formulaic as they as they come. Yeah, yeah. Um, speaking of other um, issues, you know, we were talking about quibbles with the movie. One I have is when you look at the Bond films that happened previously, they're pretty state of the art. You can, you know, kind of throw rocks at the um, projection on the boat <laughs> at the end of Thunderball. It's a little awkward. <laughs> but here, I find like there's certain shots in this movie that look really cheap. And I'm wondering if they just sunk so much money into the volcano that other aspects of the movie suffered. Because there's a lot of driving shots where like all of the projection is like yellowed. Like it doesn't even look like it's happening like it looks old it's like they found like sepia toned footage somewhere and then you know you look at that volcano erupting at the end it's not the greatest looking like there's a number of cheap shots don't know what you mean it's great <laughs> you know when i look at this movie there's so many moments that are just stylistically really interesting you know we've talked about little nelly the sequence where you have the enemy yeah. choppers being revealed via shadow on the side of the mountain look amazing but then they'll like have a sequence where they're in a car and they just cut and it's like, oh, that looks awful. Like it looks genuinely awful. And I can't really figure out why because that wasn't as much of a problem in past Bond films. See, I, I, I think that was a problem that plagued all the early Bond films and even going into the Moore films. And they all have a problem with um, with uh, uh, ramped up footage as well, they, where they would ramp up the speed of the footage. And like there's a moment in this where Bond is being driven through the streets of uh tokyo and and they're just they just for some reason they speed the footage up to try and you know engineer a sense of jeopardy uh, you don't need to do that that's pointless lads just just leave it alone it's totally fine but yeah shonky backdrops and bad uh rear projection are a staple of early bonds uh, and and I, i'm proud to see that tradition is upheld in you only live twice wait are you saying you want less sped up footage in thunderball is that what you're arguing for Oh, actually, no, I want, I want Thunderball to be entirely on fast forward. Entirely on fast forward. If you could give me a 10-minute version of Thunderball, then I am happy. But you have to play the Tom Jones song in its entirety. Sure. If you cut out the underwater sequences, uh, that's probably about 10 oh, minutes left God. of the film. So that, that works. Mm -hmm. <laughs> spare me. Spare me, Thunderball. I do need to revisit it. I'm, 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 I'm slowly but surely getting to a point now where I'm able to contemplate revisiting some of the movies that the bond of put me off for life or or i thought that the bond of honor had put me off for life uh so maybe i will go back and revisit thunderball oh this will be my, my promise to you <laughs> is that at some point in the next 10 years i will revisit thunderball <laughs> i hope it doesn't feel like 10 years while you're watching it <laughs> <laughs> it's real time mm. how long are they how long are they down there <laughs> jesus why are they underwater? Why Why are they all dressed alike? What's going on? Why is it taking 10 minutes to take a net off of a plane? What is that? <laughs> why have they remade this movie? Why did they remake this movie? Almost twice. Did, oh. Almost twice. Oh, God. Yeah. Uh, um, the only thing I had in terms of dislikes was a comment made by Tiger. And that is that uh, Kissy has a pig face. Whoa, Tiger, come on, man. Yeah, yeah. Come on now. Yeah, I mean, has anyone here seen Arrested Development? Uh, yeah. Yes. Right, so... Yeah, I, all three seasons. Thank you. That's all there ever was, <laughs> ever will be of that show. Um, whenever, I, whenever I see that scene, I am always taken back to uh, Anne, or Egg, or Her. Yes, Her, yeah. <laughs> and so in my notes, um, Aki is... Uh, uh, sorry, Kissy is referred to as Her, with a question mark every time. Yeah. Right. Um, so, are you saying that Tiger is essentially the Michael Bluth of <laughs> Japan's biggest spy organization, and he just cannot stand Kissy? And so, there's another scene where he calls her Egg. That'd be quite nice. Yeah. Uh, that that might let him off the hook a little I, bit. I could get on board. Was just, yeah. If it was just a weird Michael Bluth esque uh, character tick, rather than him being horribly sexist, accidentally leaves her in Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, maybe he can incorporate many elements of the Bluth family. So, you know, after after Aki dies, he goes, I've made a huge mistake. And <laughs> yeah, he distracts Bluefield at the end, not with a throwing star, but by doing a chicken dance. I, I'd be absolutely on board for that. Uh, like Helga Brandt dies and he says, I should have left a note. You know. <laughs> yep. yeah. Or, you know, she gets she gets killed by a loose seal. All, all these things. <laughs> 
All these things are, are upper grabs in the remake. So many balls in the air. <sighs> right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> ah, well, ah. well, you know, Scott, you referenced, you know, the whole calling Kissy a pig. And look, Tiger Tanaka, a really awesome character. I would happily watch in his own adventures, but he has some issues referring to like the women who work for him as his like personal property, things like that. Like, it's like, oh, that's awkward. But it's interesting that we've done this review and we've said next to nothing about Kissy Suzuki, mm. who is, I guess, the main Bond girl. I don't really know. Uh, she's the one that winds up, you know, with him at the end. But uh, like, do they ever even address her by name? I don't think so. I don't remember. Huh. They they definitely never say Suzuki. If they say Kissy, it's maybe once. Have you just cracked this film open accidentally? <laughs> I hate this film. Yeah, I hate this film. That's it. Yeah. Disavowed. The scales have fallen from my eyes. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Disavowed, yeah. Um, yeah, I never thought of that. I'm going to have to go back and check the tape. I don't know if they ever say Kissy. That's strange. But she is an afterthought in this film. Yeah. I think Roald Dahl had run out of ideas by this point. We always say with the Bond films, they can write one good female character and then mm, not really anymore. Though No Time to Die might have changed that. But um, yeah, this is not breaking that mold. Mm-hmm. I love that shot though, where she's on the boat, and it's clearly a rear projection, but it's made to look like some sort of like heavenly background. That shot always gets a laugh out of me. <laughs> Shonky backdrops, yes, please. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, okay, I'll throw it out to any final notes anyone has on the film before we wrap up. Uh, Chris, anything final? Any, any tidbits, notes you picked up? Uh, just a, it's a good old fashioned Bond yarn, and we get to see Bond employing some spycraft which is good. I don't like the fake out death at the beginning. I have I have questions about the logistics of that. So is everyone in on it? Because you think it's got to be for show, right? So they've got to make it look convincing enough so they can run a, a story in the newspaper so that all Bond's enemies go, thank God, he's dead. All right, we, now we can be doubly evil because we don't have to worry about Bond coming around and, and snooping around here with his terrible code name that everyone knows, and, you know, work of universal exports and the worst undercover spy in the history of the, of the world. Um, but if everyone in that opening isn't in on it, then what the hell's going on in there? So who are the guys who run in and machine gun the wall and then later on, they come down, they pull down the bed. The doctor pulls down the bed. And he's like, oh, he died at the job. Well, at least he died happy, you know, getting noshed off or whatever. I'm not entirely sure of the line. It's something like that. <laughs> and and they pull down the bed and he's there. But there's no blood, which there would be because he's been riddled with machine, bullet, you know, machine gun bullets, a bit like Sonny Corleone. So what's going on there? Are those guys firing blanks? But if so, then how are there bullet impact holes in the bed is it a bulletproof bed what's going on i i think what you're doing here chris is trying to apply logic to a bond film <laughs> I, I, this if, is my first mistake if octopus told us anything is that logic doesn't exist <laughs> <laughs> many many things uh yeah and, I, and in fairness also i was earlier on today on the empire no time to die spoiler special i was bemoaning the lack of truly great stunt sequences in No Time to Die. And I think that this movie also has a lack of that big stunt. I mean, Bond hadn't really fallen into that trap by that point. Their Mm -hmm. idea of a big stunt at this point was to tit around underwater for 25 minutes. (laughs) And, you know, there's not... You know, are there really great stunts in in Goldfinger from Rush With Love? The standout sequence in that is a fight on a train. So they hadn't really gotten into the, you know... The, the car, the car stunt in *Man with the Golden Gun*, or the you know, the parachute jump at the end of the opening sequence of *The Spy Loved Me*. So they hadn't really fallen down that rabbit hole yet. But having said that, for all the, the that I do like the action in this, the the final henchman fight or that fight with the Rock's grandfather, I did not know that. That blew my mind. By the way, was his grandfather? Yeah, yeah, and he wow. died young. He he died at the age of forty five. So yeah, that's blown my mind. That is extraordinary. Uh, so, you know, there's really good action in this movie, as I said, but it, it does lack a big signature stunt, I would say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. 
I guess I'm trying to think of when they really ramp up the stunts. It's got to be on Her Majesty's, right? Where you have like the bobsled fight. And I wonder how much of that was just having a 28 year old Lazenby where it's like, here's a really physical athletic guy. Let's maybe push the envelope a little more. I mean, Connery at this point in the run, I don't think was like, guys, I want to jump off a cliff. You know, I just, well, maybe he did. Maybe he did to want to escape the Bond films, but in terms of stunts, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like no one's jumping on alligators in this one. No. I mean, Karen Dorr gets the award for just taking the uh, header into the um, piranha tank. Like yeah. that might be the uh, biggest stunt. God rest her soul. Mm, yeah. Poor woman. Mm. Yeah. Die for her art. That's right. Um, Cam, anything for you, Tippett? Um, yeah, there's the one thing is we get the introduction, I guess, well, I guess Grant in From Russia With Love is the first of like the bond, uh, the, the blonde specter agents who are bonds, you know, physical equals here we get like, is it Hans or Franz or something like that? The big blonde guy here. No one knows. Yeah, he's very generic, but he does set a template. We're going to get a lot of generic blonde henchmen going forward. This guy's sort of the originator of the generic blonde henchmen. Um, the fight is all right, although he looks pretty sad when he takes a punch and just rolls over <laughs> Connery's back <laughs> into the piranha tank. <laughs> oh, do I have to? Oh, God, because he knew, he knew what happened to Karen Dorr, so he, he yeah. didn't want to do it. He was like, oh, come on, I've had such a good life. Wait, oh. is that Connery impression or the other guy? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell. And it's, uh, you know, he did own those piranhas, I think, or he at least fed them. So you have a little bit of an emotional connection, like the Rancor Keeper with the Rancor in Return of the Jedi. But unfortunately, <laughs> you know, Hans or Franz doesn't live to cry over his piranhas after the explosion of the volcano. Um, the only other thing I'll note that was a shot that just kind of made me uh, laugh, but in a good way, I actually really like the shot, is when, um, you know, Bond goes down this slide into t uh, Tiger Tanaka's lair. And there's this like close up of Connery's face going down the slide. Clearly, Connery was not going down any slides, but it it reminded me a lot of the Jimmy Stewart losing his mind in Vertigo shot. So I appreciated that. It actually, you know, I liked it. It's a good it's a good wallpaper for your computer if you uh, were so inclined. <laughs> I'm not going down a fucking slide. <laughs> That'll be my new iPhone lock screen after this. Absolutely. <laughs> um. Well, I, I think it's time we all hop aboard the Tiger Train <laughs> to the knock list. Now, as we have a guest this week, Cam, can you explain for Chris what the knock list is? Yes, the knock list is a tortured acronym for need to see official classics <laughs> of the Spy Hearts podcast, where every week we vote for whether a movie belongs on the list of the all timers as far as spy films go. So some movies that have made it on Three Days of the Condor, uh, Goldfinger mm -hmm. made it on, Dr. No, and mm -hmm. From Russia with Love made it on as well. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Thunderball did too in a very contentious oh, come vote. On. Come on. I, I, I was wrote. against it. I was against it. I got outvoted <laughs> by the guest. I'm sorry. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> I feel like I'm itching all over. Just, that, Thunderball's been mentioned too much. It's too much. <laughs> but everyone gets a vote, and so we will see. Yeah, if you only live twice, makes the knock list. Well, okay, can I, I this may prejudice the vote, mm. but if this doesn't make it in, I will hunt you down and kill you both, mm. uh, because, you know, well, I don't know whether that's prejudice or not, but it's better than Dr. No. Really? It's better than Thunderball. Yeah. Yeah. Really. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's on a par easily with From Russia With Love and your beloved Three Days of the Condor. So... <laughs> You know, if you vote against this film, it is a vote against it. It's you know, yeah, yes, it's problematic and occasionally racist, but it's also wonderfully inclusive and shows Japan in a new light. It has its cake and eats eats it. That's what I'm saying, basically. But it's, it's so good. It's so good. Connery made six Bond films and one vaguely Bond film, and this is top three for me. Sure. Well, I, I, I'm going to ask you the question anyway, Chris. It like, sounds like it's a yes, but is it making the list for you? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
strong no, strong no for me. <laughs> I've uh, I've listened to your arguments over the last uh, hour or so, and uh, the, yeah, I've 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 realised that I've been living a lie uh, as of when it comes to this movie. It doesn't have enough underwater scuba sequences that go on for a fucking eternity, and that's 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 sorry that that counts against it ultimately. Uh, no, the, this is this is in for me. This is in, and I was really worried about this. I'll be honest with you, revisiting this movie. Uh, because, you know, nostalgia plays a big part in how we assess these things. And I grew up loving this film. And, you know, the last time I saw it was 15 years ago. And I can't remember anything after a certain point, And I may have blacked out. And I <laughs> certainly had terrible diarrhea that day. That was, that was not good. Uh, but I was worried that coming back to this movie... The, knowing everything I know about it and how problematic it was going to be, and and certainly those are not things we could excuse and set to one side at all. We have to deal with it, and as we're assessing the movie in its overall context, I was worried that it the bloom would come off the rose a little bit with this movie for me, and it, it, it to a little bit it has, to a little to a little bit it has, but by and large this this holds up for me. This is, you know, it's it's it. It's playing with the Bond formula, but when it, it when it hits a Bond formula, it it hits it spot on. It's got some of the best images in the Bond film. It's got possibly the best bad guy introduction in the Bond film. It's got Connery, maybe because he knew he was going out and his kind of most insouciant, swaggering, tough guy best. Yes, please. Two votes, please. Can I can I vote twice? <laughs> you only vote twice. No. <laughs> Uh, no. Um, <laughs> well, that's a yes, but it sounds a bit... What about you, Cam? For me, this one is a no. I enjoy this movie. Like, the thing is, <laughs> a lot of good movies have not made the knock list. Like, movies we genuinely enjoyed. Like, um, name, name, name three. <laughs> the Bo- name, name three. Okay. Name three films. Uh, the Born Identity, <laughs> Men in Black, and um, what was the other one? Tomorrow Never Dies. You look at it, like so, stricken with horror. <laughs> Cam, what is your criteria for getting into the knock list? Is it just you know, well, you know, is it just how you feel on the day? Is there is it just completely random? Is it a you know, roll the dice, a toss of the coin? What 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 is what has the born identity done to you? Um, I, well, born supremacy made it in. Uh, so for us, oh, it was okay, just, you're fine. Carry on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We felt like that was the pinnacle of the Bourne franchise. Bourne Identity is very oh, yeah, good. Yeah. It just doesn't quite yeah. hit the high mark for what I look for in that franchise. And that's kind of how I feel here, where I do enjoy You Only Live Twice. It's just, to me, like the first one that feels creaky. And I know we've gone back and forth about whether Thunderball is creaky. And I guess I just come down on the side of like, this is the dividing line for me, where we get a little more of the creakiness. But it has iconic stuff. You've got some very memorable locations, some really memorable characters. Just doesn't quite hold together for me as strongly as I'd like. And I think Lewis Gilbert takes this formula and does it better in Spy Who Loved Me. Okay. Wow. All okay. right. This doesn't happen very often. This does not happen I can, very I can often. See, I can see where this is going. That's that's fine. That's fine. Now, thanks for inviting me on your podcast, guys. It's been really, really fun. Really fun. This personal attack of me that's lasted an hour or so. This is, It's been lovely. Okay, so we have a yes and a no, and, and I, I actually get to cast a deciding vote for once. I, I feel an immense sense of pressure. What is because... your Fenmo address? Uh, <laughs> uh, what, uh, how, how open to bribes are you? You can find my t-shirts on redbubble.com slash spyhards. <laughs> Adding to basket. <laughs> okay, this is how I break it down. I enjoy this film more than Thunderball. Mm-hmm. And this is my problem because Thunderball ended up on the knock list. I was outvoted on Thunderball. Yeah. And a part of me wants to outvote Cam as a spite to put this on the list because Thunderball made it on. Honestly, this is the, this is the most suspenseful thing I've ever been a part of. <laughs> I, I cannot tell. I cannot tell where you're going with this. I can't tell whether you're about to go. I want to vote yes just to spite Cam, sure. but I'm not gonna. Or whether you're gonna go. No, I don't know what you're going to do. Are you going to crush my dreams, Chris? I'm not going to crush your dreams. Oh, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god! This is huge. This film—if you played this to a newbie, 
to the Bond franchise. And this is what the knock list is. It's meant to be a list of films you can put in front of a newbie and go, these are the best spy films. If you put Thunderball in front of someone, I think a lot of people might die. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's fair. That is they, fair. They will jump in the piranha tank from boredom, yep. okay? <laughs> Although they might develop a water aversion from watching the film. I don't know. Yes, you never mind Jaws. <laughs> Watch Thunderball <laughs> and you will never go swimming again. <laughs> oh, that's the missing tagline for that film. <laughs> but um, I have more fun with You Only Live Twice. Yes, it's got some questionable things with the turning of Japanese. But I, if, if you contextualize that and you may, remade this film now, they wouldn't do that, of course. But a lot of this film would remain intact. I think it's still f- a fun romp. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's Connery doing maybe not his best, but if if Goldfinger and Thunderball made it in for Connery's performances, then I think this is just about as good as they were. Um, so ultimately, I'm going to say yes. I mean, I can totally understand this, especially when you've got things like the Volcano Lair, the reveal of Blofeld. Like, There's a lot of iconic franchise elements here that... I think, you know, even if you don't necessarily dig the whole movie, they're very important. And mm. yeah, I can totally understand why you would want to put this on the knock list. Excellent backtracking there, Cam. I, thank you. I, thank you. That's what I do. Admire it. Cracky bit of vehicle reverse in there. Uh, so, <laughs> so well done. We, we inducted our man Flint because of his effect on, <laughs> on, on like films, because of what it meant to films. So I mean, if, if that can get in, I think this can too. I mean, I, 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 using that criteria, just any film will get on the knock list. It's just well, like, you know, Men in Black International yeah. didn't make it on. You'll be pleased to know. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it should. It should get well, on the knock list because it's it's just a film, and <laughs> it 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 has a beginning and a middle and an end, and and you know. That's what our man Flint has. He- hearing our podcast deconstructed by a guy who actually reviews films for a living is it's really nice. <laughs> yeah, it's... I, I feel deeply fulfilled about my hobby and passion now. Listen, yeah. listen. I introduced I introduced a segment to the Empire podcast uh, during the pandemic called the Three Fact Structure, mm-hmm. and we haven't played it on the show. It's 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 wildly controversial. <laughs> it's divided our audience completely down the down the middle, and uh, we had we did a live show a few weeks ago in London. And Jason Isaacs was our guest, and he came on and he played the three fact structure with us. And he pointed out he eviscerated the concept of the three fact structure uh, live in front of you know loads of people watching it on stream, live stream, and loads of people in the audience. And we haven't played it since because he it was ba- it's basically a, a segment in which I ask my my colleagues to come up with a fact, and it's not themed. And the only criteria is that I have to not have heard of it before. And that's a bit arbitrary and a bit spurious because I could just say that I've never heard it before or that I have heard it before. I could just lie. So there's no real rhyme or reason or structure to it. And so that was pulled apart from me by Jason Isaac. So I know your pain. Mm. I know your pain when you haven't thought something through. <laughs> Well, uh, this was the last episode of Spy Hearts, guys. Thanks for tuning in. It will not live twice. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, oh, boy. You, well, you glad I stuck, to, uh, stuck around to the end now? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, so glad. Ah, well, when I'm okay. available to come back, I'll do. I'll do more. I'll do more bonds. Uh, yeah, but just yes to all of them. Yeah, we, we've already got your vote. Why bother? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm a yes. I'm in. I'm in. Any any film. Any film. Is it in focus? Yes. Then it's in. I'm good. I stand by my no vote. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, there's uh, one no and two yeses, and as such, you only live twice. It's finding its second life on the knock list. Um, usually, I thank the guest for joining us at this point, but I I don't think I will. <laughs> It's been a real pleasure. It's been a real pleasure. It's been very, very. It's been it's been, been entertaining. You you guys have had fun. Yeah, wow. I, can, I can see your I can see from your faces you've had fun. I, yeah. I I've got a box of tissues near me to cry after. <laughs> so, uh, um, but you know, Chris, should should our listeners want somewhere to go after this? Now that our podcast has ended. Um, where can people find you? 
Well, this is basically my grand plan. Uh, any podcast that I guest on, I end that podcast. And so therefore the audience, you know, they're kind of disembodied at that point and they have to find somewhere to dock. And uh, the Empire podcast is the place to come. So we're out every Friday. We have a regular podcast out every Friday. And uh, it's basically just a group of people sitting around talking about films, uh, but in a hopefully fun and entertaining and irreverent way. And we have uh, great guests every single week. And if you like uh, spoiler special discussions, we also have a subscriber only spoiler special channel, which I can heartily recommend. But then again, I would, wouldn't I? Uh, so that's where you can that's where you can find me every week. And I'm on Twitter as at Chris Hewitt. And um, the No Time to Die special will be for subscribers, right? So that's something people may, may want to check out who like this podcast. That is correct. That is correct. And we're doing a couple of spoiler specials for No Time to Die. Uh, so, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be a lot of fun. Today's recording was two and a half hours. And uh, I expect next week's to be just as long because there's a lot of it's, it's a complicated film. There's a lot of. Uh, Farian opinions on it, a lot of dissenting mm. voices, and uh, so which is good because you know sometimes if you've got four people in a room and they all love the film, then it can get a little bit dull. Mm -hmm. So it's good that we're all arguing with each other, as we have here yeah. tonight, guys. So this is a good thing. It's a good thing that we have disagreed. Well, right. you know, I. I, I can't thank you enough for, for for jumping on, Chris. Despite my ego being completely destroyed and obliterated at this point, um, you know, I, I've we've had Helen O'Hara on already, um, and you know, she was really nice. So we'll probably have her back. Hey, whoa, come on, hey, I'm nice people, all right, you fuckers. I'm nice people. How dare you insinuate I'm not nice people? Well, uh, I've never been so insulted in my life. I am available to do more. <laughs> But yeah, we're slowly assembling our Infinity Gauntlet of Empire hosts. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know what stone you are. You can pick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I am the reality stone because I have brought a dose of reality to this podcast. And I have, I have, I have, I've woken you guys up. I told you. I told you. I, I, that's what I do. Yeah. I wake people up. <laughs> well, to the knock list. <laughs> Oh, no, I, I love it. I love it. I love the idea. I love the idea of the knock list. I was just, I was, you know, I think what happened was I felt threatened and I lashed out. Mm, mm. Been there, been there. <laughs> I, I have that effect on people. Don't worry. It's fine. Um, but yeah, Chris, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Pleasure. Thank you so much. Well, Cam, the question is, what are we doing next week? Well, Scott, we've been tackling giant volcanoes and Blofeld and larger-than-life circumstances. We're going to go stripped down. We're going back to the 70s, baby, to hang out with Warren Beatty in Alan J. Pakula's The Parallax View. Uh, we loved talking about Three Days of the Condor, and this is the film that immediately came up when we mentioned that episode to people. So uh, we, we've had requests for this film for quite some time. I'm glad we're finally getting around to it. I've never seen it, but uh, you tell me good things. Yeah, it's one that if you look up like reviews of the time or kind of middle of the road, but it's over time really gained a massive following and has become one that people really look to as one of the pinnacles of 70s spy films. So I'm excited to uh, revisit it for myself. Well, there you go, folks. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to check out the Parallax View and join us next week. We are, of course, a proud member of Quite the Thing and Podpre Podcast Networks, which you can find out more about them on their websites and of course the knock list which was deconstructed today thankfully by our guest chris can be found on letterbox.com slash spyhards and finally don't forget to follow us discreetly at spyhards that's s-p-y-h-a-r-d-s on facebook twitter and instagram but until next week listeners no this is business <laughs>